Greetings, fellow Bible readers. Welcome to week 22 of our 2016 read-through of the Bible. This week we're finishing up the book of Esther, and then we're going to be heading into the book of Job. And that book of Job probably deserves a little bit of extra introduction because it breaks from the pattern we've seen in all the Bible books that we've been looking at so far. So far in our reading, we've been looking at books that are classified as historical books. They record events, tell us who did what at particular times. With the book of Job, we're now heading into a, a type of, of book that is called poetry. And you'll notice it in the way that most Bibles format the book of Job. You'll see a lot more indentations uh, in various places. And that's to indicate that this is poetry. Now, Hebrew poetry, unlike English poetry, doesn't necessarily depend on rhyme and rhythm and meter so much. What it really depends on is putting parallel thoughts together, either thoughts that are, are nearly identical to each other or thoughts that are kind of opposite to each other to provide a contrast. So in the book of Job, we find an awful lot of that. The other thing that makes the book of Job rather different from the other books we've been looking at so far is that not only is it written in a poetry format, but it's also a conversation for the most part between Job and several of his friends. And so it's not going to be quite as focused on this person did this in this at this time, or this person went and fought this war, but it's going to be a conversation between Job and his friends. And it's going to give us some pretty um, bad examples for how to comfort somebody who is dealing with suffering and problems in this life. So let's dive on into the details of the readings for this week. On day one, we're going to be finishing up the book of Esther by looking at chapters 6 through 10. And here we continue to see God's providence working in the background using human sinful people to preserve his promised nation that is going to provide the Savior. One of the things that can be a little troubling to people as they close out the book of as we close out the book of Esther is the seeming bloodthirstiness of Esther and Mordecai and the Jewish people in general. We see Esther and Mordecai issuing this edict for the Jews to defend themselves. We see the Jews killing thousands of people. And there's a couple of things that you want to keep in mind in, as you think about this and read about this and evaluate, are these people really bloodthirsty or not? Remember that what occasioned this was Haman's edict that anybody could kill the Jews anywhere and plunder their stuff and take their stuff on the particular day that had been set. And so since that command could not be revoked, there was no way to get rid of that under Persian law. If a Persian king made a law, it remained in force. And so that was going to happen. There was no way to avoid it. And so the only way to take care of that was to allow the Jews to defend themselves. And something that speaks rather interestingly about the motivation of those Jews is when we do hear about them defending themselves and all of the killing that went on, we find that they don't lay their hands on the plunder from their opponents. And I think that says something about their motivation in the whole situation. So a couple of things to keep in mind there. Then on day two, we head into the book of Job by reading chapters one through five. And these are the chapters that lay out kind of the history of who Job was, what his life was like, and then how he, he got into the situation where he found himself suffering intense personal losses and pain and difficulty in this life. And one of the things that's, that's very important to take away from these opening chapters of Job is that even though Satan is the one who is, is attacking Job very clearly and directly, that God is the one who still is in control. He fixes the limits for how much Satan is able to do. And that's a, a wonderful comfort for us when we face problems is that we have a God who fixes the limits for how much suffering and how long that suffering is going to last. Then on the remaining days of the week, days three through seven, I'm not going to go through and, and pull out specific thoughts from those days because, like I said, this is a conversation that's going on. And so really it all kind of fits and flows together. Job is kind of a right on one side of that conversation in many ways against his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And you'll see a couple of themes that are fairly consistent in the conversation between Job and his three friends and that they bring up. Job's three friends 
tend to focus on the fact that Job must have done something specifically wrong for God to punish him. They pictured God in many ways as a judge in a courtroom and, and is dealing with Job in, in the same way that a judge in a courtroom would deal with somebody. That if he's done something wrong, he'll get punished. If he's done something good, he'll be rewarded. And so Job's friends basically encourage him, hey, the reason why all this bad stuff is happening to you is because you did something wrong. You messed up in some major way that God is now getting you back for. You've committed some specific sin, and so you need to repent of that specific sin that you've committed and make up for it and do what's right, and then God will restore you and bless you again. You'll notice that that's a very work-righteous way of looking at the situation and provides absolutely no comfort for Job. Job constantly, Job constantly complains about the fact that these people are not giving him any kind of comfort with this message. On the other hand, you'll notice Job, he continues to maintain his innocence of some specific sin. He's not necessarily denying uh, original sin. He's not necessarily denying that he is a sinner, but he, he is defending himself against the accusation that there's some specific sin that he's committed that God is dealing with him about, that God is, is punishing him for. And what's interesting to note about Job's responses to his friends is that even though he does complain quite a bit about the suffering and the pain that he's going through, he does highlight and note that he still trusts in the Lord and he still relies on the Lord. In fact, there are some of the most beautiful gospel promises and, 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 and statements of the Old Testament come out of the book of Job. In fact, one that is, is almost inseparably, inseparably connected to Easter in Job 19 that you'll get to read this week. I believe it's going to be on day six that you'll get to it. That beautiful, I know that my Redeemer lives statement that, that was the basis for the, the Christian hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. Also, a little bit before that, in chapter 16, there is a, another passage right near the end of the chapter where Job beautifully talks about the work of Jesus as our intercessor, our mediator with God. Um, and so a, a beautiful passage there of, of comfort and encouragement that Job speaks even in the midst of the suffering that he's in. So that's all for this week. Enjoy the book of Job. We'll see you next week for the second half.